Welcome back to Public Finance in Canada. I'm Keith Kucha, and in this video, we're going to be taking a look at a cost benefit analysis. So, okay, backtrack. Where are we in terms of everything here? Well, in the past video, we took a look at welfare economics. We saw that with the fundamental theorem of welfare economics, that there was room for a benevolent social planner. This social planner could change the predistributions in order to achieve socially desirable outcomes. That is to increase social notions of fairness or how a society necessarily wanted distributions to take place. We then ran into a problem. Arrow's impossibility theorem showed that, hey, yes, cool, we could have a social planner come up with this, but it's going to be nearly impossible, if not extremely difficult, in order to discern the collective will. So Arrow's impossibility theorem kind of said, yeah, you know what, we really can't do it, not to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but just to say, hey, there's going to be some big difficulty in having a social planner kind of engage in these activities to increase social welfare. We then wrapped up with taking a look at the theory of the second best, and we saw that under the theory of the second best, if our assumptions of the fundamental theorem of welfare economics were not satisfied, again, there may be room for a social planner to introduce further distortions that may actually then increase social welfare altogether. So that is altogether we kind of saw, yes, there's some difficulties, but there's room for a social planner, that is to say government intervention, to come into these markets to increase social welfare, to increase society's well-being. Okay, this leads to a question and addresses some of the main issues that a that economics addresses. Uh, the first question is, okay, great, we can have a social planner, we can go and have government intervention, but we live in a world of scarcity, right? We talked at this in the first video, we live in this world of scarcity, scarcity necessitates us to make choices, choices necessitate opportunity costs. So the question with this then becomes, which projects does the government engage in? Which markets does the government intervene in? What are the costs? What are the benefits of this intervention? And what ought the government to do? Well, what we're going to introduce here, our cost benefit analysis, is a decision making tool. And this decision making tool is one way in which we can evaluate whether or not a project should be given the green light to go ahead. And if we have competing projects, how to determine which project we choose. Okay, objectives for this video. Uh, by the end, we should have an understanding of how cost-benefit analysis are conducted, as well as some of the common areas and difficulties in performing one. Now, that being said, easily we could have an entire course just on cost-benefit analysis. In fact, there's many courses where the entire 14 weeks is just devoted to this. So in no way is this video aimed to give us the full ins and outs of a CBA, cost-benefit analysis. Rather, what this is aimed for is just to provide a quick and dirty overview to give us an appreciation of this. So that being said, let's jump over. Let's jump into the idea of a cost-benefit analysis, and then we will go and take a look at the steps to performing one. Without further ado, let's go take a look. Okay, so let's suppose that you are sitting there in some government ministry or a department head of some part of the public service, whether it be municipal, provincial, federal, etc. Now, in this, you have, of course, only limited revenue sources. You only have so much money in your budget, so much money that you've been given. However, despite this, you have several conflicting proposals. So doesn't really make sense in terms of our uh, ministries that we'd be taking a look at. These would be competing ministries as well. But let's just take a look at it from this side. We have on one side, we could devote this money to building a new school. Or we could devote this to building a new hospital. Now, unfortunately, we don't have enough money to do both. That's, of course, the nature of scarcity. We only have these limited resources, but nearly or by really all intents and purposes, unlimited wants. So we have to choose. Do we build a school or do we build a hospital? Question is, is first of all, how do you decide which one of these to build? So, okay, that's the first one. And then the second part is, how do you defend this decision, right? Why is a hospital deserving of our funding rather than a school or vice versa? Why is a school deserving over the hospital? 
one way we could decide is we could make this decision normatively. So normative, a normative decision or a normative statement would be a value-based one. So that is you're just strictly looking at it and you're going, hey, I value education because I value education. I believe these funds should go towards a school or alternatively, I believe that we need more access to healthcare. I believe that access to healthcare is important for a thriving community. And because of that, I believe that this money needs to go towards a hospital. Now, a lot of decisions are made these this way. And right, a lot of public feedback, a lot of the letters into city council to the MLAs, the MPs, etc., they are often based off of these normative feelings. And not to discount these, right? Not to say that this normative decision making is necessarily bad, but it's normative in nature, right? And this is kind of that basis of Vero's impossibility theorem is we're all gonna have our own values, our own opinions of right and wrong of where things ought to go. And it's very difficult to actually determine or to argue why one ought to be more important than the other. So what we can introduce then is we can introduce an objective, an objective or a positive, and so in this case here, what we're talking about is a fact-based, right? It's based off of numbers, based off of fact, based off of something we can point to. And we can introduce an objective or a positive decision tool. And this objective or positive decision tool is our cost-benefit analysis, CBA, cost-benefit analysis. Now, on the surface, a cost benefit analysis is extremely simple. It's laughably simple. It goes just very simply if our benefits are greater than our costs, then we'll approve the project. Yes, benefits are greater than costs. We say, yes, it has the green light. It's good to go. We have more benefit to society from this project taking place than we're going to have costs to society. So, hey, all together, societal welfare will increase if we give this guy the green light. If we have competing projects, so in this case here, both the school and the hospital, if they both have benefits greater than costs, well, then ideally we would choose the project with the greatest net benefit. That is the one where the benefit is the largest in comparison to the costs. Okay, that's the idea there. Of course, we could have the alternative if benefits were less than costs. That is, hey, to do this project, we'd have more social costs than we would have social benefits. Well, then clearly this should be, this should be a no-go. That's gonna decrease social welfare. It's gonna make society worse off altogether. We shouldn't even entertain this project once we come to this conclusion. Okay, so as we said, hey, this decision between a school and a hospital, it should boil down strictly towards this objective decision-making find out which one of these two projects has the largest net benefit, and then based off of that one with the largest net benefit, be like, hey, this is gonna increase social welfare the most. This is where we should put our money, our scarce public funds. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your point of view, is that this decision is ultimately a political one. That is, as long as both school and hospital give us a positive net benefit to society, well, it's going to be really based off of the normative decision-making criteria of the politician in charge, who will then choose which project we pursue. Um, so in that case there, yes, the analyst might say, hey, the school, the school is definitely the winner altogether in this case. Huge, huge net benefit to society. Hospital still wins. It's still good, but just not as big of a net benefit. And again, I'm just picking this at random. In that case there, the analyst could say, yes, we should definitely build the school. However, the politician, the decision maker at one point or another might, for whatever reason, say, yeah, cool, but I value a hospital more. And so despite the cost benefit analysis, because they're both positive net benefits, the hospital is what's built at the end of the day. So ultimately it's a political decision this just gives us information just gives us some tools in order to facilitate such a political decision okay well while the idea 
of the cost-benefit analysis is simple enough, as we've seen, uh, its implementation can be significantly more difficult. And let's take a look at a quick example to kind of demonstrate this difficulty. Most of these points we'll bring up again as we go through our steps of conducting a cost-benefit, but to at least highlight them here at this point as well. Let's suppose that we're performing an analysis on whether or not to build a new highway. So, okay, just kind of like way back when, I say way back when, it really wasn't that long ago, way back when, when the Coquihalla was being constructed. So we're going to build a new highway and we're looking at putting this in place. Okay, so there we go. We have our new highway going in. Well, what we want to do is we want to, of course, figure out, well, what are all the costs of building this highway as well as what are all the benefits? Now, some of this is going to be pretty easy. Some of this is going to be pretty straightforward. So, for example, what we're going to have is underneath our costs or our inputs into the construction of this highway is we will have our explicit costs. And explicit costs, these are, well, they're explicit. They're laid out. They are budget items. They're relatively easy to determine. So these explicit costs, these are going to be materials, labor, cost of funds. All of this is really easy to gather. We know what that's going to be. It's just, hey, okay, we need this many workers. We're going to pay this many workers this hourly wage. We have this many hours altogether. So, okay, given this FTE, you work out your cost of labor. Cost of materials, you know the cost of the asphalt, you know the cost of the fill, you know the cost of everything else that goes into it. You can get a pretty good estimate of all of these explicit costs. However, that's not the only cost of building such a highway. In a cost benefit analysis, what we would also want to include would be implicit costs. And what do we mean by implicit costs? Well, these are costs that are faced, but they're not necessarily explicitly laid out. That is, no accountant would go and include them in a cost of a project. However, just because an accountant might not necessarily include these in the cost of a project doesn't mean that they're not costs. And as economists, this is an area that we would be very interested in, is these implicit costs. Some examples, and by no way is this an exhaustive list of possible implicit costs from this highway, but one potential cost would be an increase in cost of materials. Increase in cost of materials. And let's talk about this one just, just briefly. So to build this highway, we need a massive amount of asphalt. And by putting all this demand on asphalt, we're going to push up the price of asphalt. Now, by doing so, we now have pushed up this local price of asphalt, and now all of the other local users of asphalt, they now also have to pay this high price because we decided to build a highway. This has essentially crowded out some other consumption of this good. They might have gone and they might have paved a local municipal road, but now the cost is too prohibitive for them to do so, and that is a cost of this project. Beyond this, uh, we could say the same for labor costs. We're going to need a whole bunch of workers, a whole bunch of laborers in order to build this. If these laborers are not at ready supply, we might have to attract the laborers to the project by offering them higher wages. By offering them higher wages, we are effectively pushing up the cost of labor, which then makes it more expensive to conduct any of these construction projects. So again, crowding out other potential projects. So an implicit cost there. Another implicit cost that we might want to consider is, of course, environmental costs. Environmental costs. While the cost of materials, it might be a little bit abstract, might take a little bit of work to figure out, okay, what was the cost of pushing up that price of asphalt? What was the cost of increasing the wage rate altogether because of this? What is the crowding out effect, so to say? The environmental impact is not necessarily very easy to quantify. Say we have to build the highway through a sensitive ecosystem. What are the costs of doing so? Even if we don't have to go through a sensitive ecosystem, just the fact that we are building this highway, that we are releasing CO2, that over the lifetime of this highway, we're going to have traffic. All of this traffic is going to be emitting noise pollution, is going to be emitting CO2, is going to be having et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? 
all of these are going to be other costs of the project that we would want to consider. As you can imagine, some of these are going to be pretty difficult, pretty difficult to work out. So things that we would need to consider, things we would need to keep in mind, and stuff we will talk about farther as we go through our steps of conducting our cost benefit analysis. On the flip side, we're going to have our benefits. And again, underneath our benefits, we will have both explicit benefits. And again, these are more or less the easy ones. These are the straightforward ones where, hey, okay, we've built a new highway. Because of a new highway, we have shorter traffic time for commercial traffic. It's easier to ship goods and services. This shorter traffic time means that, hey, this amount of dollars in savings for commercial traffic. Yay, that's a bonus. That means cheaper goods for everybody. This is good. This is why we want to build new highways, at least one of the reasons for it. However, there are other benefits. Some of the other benefits would be our implicit benefits. And what would we have here in implicit benefits? Well, one of the implicit benefits, while yes, we might have had environmental costs of producing this highway, of choosing this project, we might actually also have an implicit benefit that is environmental. And let's suppose that by building our new highway, we have a more direct route that is quicker, it's more fuel efficient, it's not as many hills that you're going through. So that is by rerouting traffic off of the old highway onto this new highway, we're actually able to burn less gas by traveling from A to B. In that case there, that is an implicit benefit of this project, right? This is an environmental gain to us altogether. That's a good thing. We'd want to include that. We also have another huge benefit often of creating these projects such as highways would be lives saved. Right, if we go back and think about building the Coquihalla, right, as much as here in BC we complain or we go, oh my goodness, the Coquihalla, that thing is so dangerous in the winter. And yes, it can be. It is significantly safer than the alternatives of Highway 3 or Highway 1. That is, by building this new highway, we are building it kind of better to higher safety standards. And by doing so, we have the potential to save some lives. By saving these lives, this is a huge benefit to the project, but it kind of begs the question, what is a life worth, right? What is a life worth? If we were to kind of quantify this and say, yes, we saved two lives every year by making this new highway, well, what is the monetary value of those two lives? And right, some of you might instantly kind of be like feeling uneasy, like, ooh, Keith, what value of a life? How can you do that? That seems really unethical. Um, yes, many people would argue that it is unethical. However, the flip side of that argument is that it's almost equivalently unethical not to give a value to a life. And this is something that we will talk about farther as we go through our cost benefit analysis. Ah, you know what? Let's just have a quick go at it now, because, well, why not? Let's, let's take a look at our two competing projects. Let's say that we had for our two competing projects, we had either, um, actually, no, no, no. Let's go back to our initial case. We could either look at a school or we could look at a hospital. These are our two projects that we could consider. Now, let's suppose that we take the stance that life is priceless. That is, you know what, it is not right to put a price tag on a life. It is not right to value a life, to put a monetary value on it. It is priceless. What this is really saying by saying that life is priceless is saying that the value of life is unquantifiable. It is infinite. So that is any time we save a life, that is instantly infinite benefit. So, okay, maybe you already see the problem going on here. Between these two projects, let's suppose that their costs, both implicit and explicit, are identical. Just, just for ease, right? Let's say that both of them have a cost of 100 million. So 100 million. The school the school is going to offer benefits, both implicit and explicit, of let's say 150 million. So yay, we have a net benefit here altogether. However, the hospital, 
the hospital is going to provide benefits of, well, hey, it's a hospital. What do you do in a hospital? You save people's lives primarily, right? You heal them, you get them better, you prevent them from dying. That is, if you just save one life a year or one life over the entire course of this hospital existing, the benefit of building the hospital is infinite. So if we were to work out the net benefit, well, we get the net benefit of the school to be 50 million. We get the net benefit of the hospital to be infinite. Which project do we choose? We always choose the hospital. That is, if we fail to put a value on life, we fail to allocate resources appropriately, and we end up just throwing all of our resources towards things that end up helping those things that we don't want to value. And that is problematic. Similarly, if we just decide, hey, you know what, let's just forget about it. Let's just say, hey, clearly it's a problem if we value life at infinity. That's ridiculous. What if we just leave it out of the equation altogether? What if we just go, yeah, life is priceless, so it's not even going to be one of the benefits of building it? Well, hey, if that's not even one of the benefits of building the hospital, well, then in this case here, the benefits provided by the hospital are going to be extremely small, such that in this case here, we might actually only get benefits of 90 million. In that case there, negative 10 million, uh, we're in a scenario where we would now never build the hospital. So we kind of run into this problem where we have these very difficult to value objects or these very difficult to value things in the world around us, such as life, such as environmental degradation, such as value of certain species. And it becomes very controversial to put a dollar value on them. However, the failure to put a dollar value on these items is equivalently problematic. So does any of these non-market values, yes, there's some difficulty in creating this value of the good, but we have to recognize that they do have value and we need to determine that value in order to be able to accurately assess the benefit of a project. We'll talk about it again later, but another kind of example of that would be our polar bears. If you weren't really aware, our polar bears are going extinct. Question is, is this that big of a deal? Uh, animals are going extinct constantly throughout history, and not just throughout human history. I mean, throughout there's the history of the Earth, we have gained and we've lost species of animals. Mind you, with human-caused global change, we are uh, predicting that close to 50% of current species may be extinct within the next uh Within the next century, I think it's a bit of a lower time span than that, but we'll say the next century just to be safe. Question is, if that's the case, if we're going to lose half of our species, should we as humanity, should we as society aim to protect, aim to conserve, aim to prevent some of these species from going extinct? If the answer is yes, we should, well, why? What is the value that we get from these? Is it actually worthwhile to save one species over another? For example, if it was going to be mosquitoes are going extinct, most of you would go, eh, no biggie. I'm kind of okay with that. However, something like seals or penguins, something that's cute, we tend to go, oh my goodness, we need to save them. Similarly, something like polar bears, rather iconic, you get value just from knowing that a polar bear exists, whether or not you've ever seen one, whether or not you ever want to see one, just knowing that this iconic animal exists, you get value from it. In order to determine whether it is worth putting our scarce resources towards saving polar bears, right? Keep in mind, if we're putting money, if we're putting resources towards saving polar bears, these are resources that cannot be used towards other purposes. These are resources that cannot go towards building new schools, cannot go towards building new hospitals because they're used for the polar bears. In order to determine if this is an effective use of those resources, we need to know what a polar bear is worth. Turns out a polar bear is worth about $420,000 a piece. So through massive amounts of research, the government of Canada went through through interviewing, through a whole massive project. You can search it up. You can read about it online. 
we have determined that each and every polar bear is worth about $420,000 each. That is, each Canadian household would be willing to spend about $500 per household in order to preserve the polar bears. This is important, uh, sorry, $500 per polar bear. So this is important because what it gives us is our value of saving the polar bear. That is our benefit if we can prevent their extinction. What we then have to evaluate is what is the cost of doing so. If the cost of saving a polar bear far exceeds $420,000 a bear, unfortunately, as sad as that is to say, it is not money well spent. That is money that is being thrown away into this project. This is money that could have been used towards education, could have been used towards providing clean water to communities, could have been used for one of a hundred million other demands on government, on public funds. So big thing to remember, and this is often forgotten about in the public realm, is that we live in this world of scarcity. Scarcity necessitates choices, choices face opportunity costs. Anytime we decide to put money towards one project, that is another project that goes without. As hard as that is to say, as hard as that is to say that, and I don't know what the outcome is of this polar bear analysis. I'm not saying that the result is we just let polar bears go extinct. I'm just saying that when, if the costs do exceed the benefits, as unfortunate as that may be, it is not an efficient place to be putting, to be throwing our resources at. So the big idea with this valuation of non-market goods and something we'll come back to discuss the uh, controversies around as we carry on through. Okay, so let's take a look at our steps to conduct a cost benefit analysis. There's nine of them all together. So nine steps to conducting a cost benefit at least from our perspective, there's other views as to how to conduct this, but I find this formalized approach kind of just the easiest, most straightforward way to kind of flow one to the next to the next so that you're not missing anything along the way. And to start off, let's just list all nine of them for us, and then we'll go through each of these nine steps individually. So first thing we want to do is define our referent group. So referent group, well, right now I'll just list them all and then we'll talk about them because some of them don't have much to talk about. So first we'll define the referent group. Second, we'll select our portfolio of options, which projects we're deciding between. Three, we're gonna catalog potential impacts and select our measurement indicators. That is, we'll list all of the costs, all of the benefits. We're not even concerned necessarily with the value of them. We're just saying, hey, this is all the impacts of this project. Step four, we want to determine what the base case is over the life of the project. What would happen if we did nothing, right? Five, we want to monetize all the impacts. So going back to step three, where we listed all of the impacts, in step five, we actually want to monetize them now. We want to put the value that we would associate to that impact to that impact. Step six, we want to calculate the net present value. Some of these costs, some of these benefits are going to accrue forever or distantly into the future, we need to figure out what that future money is worth in today's values, what the present value of those future costs and those future benefits are. Step seven, we'd want to identify the distribution of the costs and benefits. Who's facing the costs? Who's facing the benefits? Is it just one group for each one? Ah, that might be problematic. Step eight, we'd want to perform sensitivity testing. A lot of these previous steps are going to be based off of assumptions we make, are going to be based off of uncertainties. We would want to recognize those uncertainties. We would want to kind of fluctuate between the possible extreme cases of our uncertainty and see if that impacts our results. Finally, in step nine, we're going to make a recommendation. As we said earlier, very simply, if benefits exceed costs, yes, we recommend the project. If costs exceed benefits, we say, uh, no, thank you. This, uh, this project's not going to be good to go ahead. Again, some of these steps are going to be ultimately political in nature. We'll identify those as we go through. And again, as we kind of alluded to already, many of these steps are kind of filled with uncertainty, filled with pretty grand assumptions that need to be made. And we'll highlight those as we go through. And that's, of course, subject to our sensitivity 
test it. So let's start off with our first one there, defining the referent group. So what the referent group is, is really determining whose costs and whose benefits we will incorporate into the project, into the analysis as we go through. This choice of a referent group is by far and large political. It's political because it's the politicians choosing who to include and who not to include. This is important because a lot of projects have global scale. That is the benefits are reached globally, the costs are felt globally, but we don't necessarily want to include the entire globe in our local project. Okay, example of that, you're like, what? How do we have a global impact in all of this? So let's, let, let's take a look at a quick example in order to evaluate this. Let's suppose that here in British Columbia, so here in BC, we launch a program to increase the adoption of electric vehicles. Now, okay, without getting into all the details of costs and benefits and all that, let's just focus on a few of them. One of these is going to be that, hey, if we focus on electric vehicles, this will be less local pollution, right? This is going to be especially true in the lower mainland where the smog tends to hang between the coastal mountains over the lowland flats there of greater Vancouver is that if we moved away from ICE, internal combustion engines, towards EV, this would result in less local pollution. Less local pollution means less uh, cases of COPD, that's uh, breathing problems, less visits to the hospital, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Ultimately, lives saved because of this. It's amazing how many lives are lost each year just due to particulate in the air. So by adopting EVs, we have less local pollution. This would be a benefit, right? This would be a benefit. However, if you were not aware, electric vehicles, they utilize a lot of precious rare earth metals. Primarily, one of the big ones is lithium. Right, lithium ion batteries. The process of mining lithium is essentially just destroying the earth. It is massive, it is a massive scar, a massive pit. It has massive damage to that local ecosystem. Now, okay, from BC's perspective though, this lithium mining is foreign. It is somewhere else abroad, somewhere else in the world. If we had our referent group as just global, well, this benefit of less local pollution would be offset either entirely, or this might actually be a larger cost. I'm not 100% sure on the comparison between the two, right? But this local benefit could be offset or completely outweighed by this foreign cost. If we set our referent group to just strictly local, so strictly British Columbians, well, if that was the case, if we're just looking at British Columbians, yes, this is a cost to somewhere else in the world from having more electric vehicles being made, but it's not a cost that we are concerned about. So you kind of see there's a bit of a problem with that, is that, hey, we can kind of put on our blinders, just focus on what we're interested in, and just kind of create a project that gives us the benefits or the costs that we want. Hopefully that's not the goal that's being had. Hopefully we're not doing it that way that, hey, we have an alternative motive. We just want more electric vehicles. So because of that, we're gonna ignore this kind of unfortunate reality and yay, everything looks good. Hopefully that's not the goal, right? Hopefully the goal is a bit more altruistic than that, a bit more positive than that. And the fact that we are trying to save lives, we are trying to make cleaner air locally through this less local pollution keeping in mind that all that local pollution, all that smog does end up ultimately becoming part of our global pollution as it ends up entering the upper atmosphere, et cetera, et cetera. So what starts off as local pollution does ultimately end up becoming global pollution. A little bit less, I don't know, depressing. We could also take a look at another kind of thing with our referent group of, again, being a new interchange. So here in the South Island, we have just finally, in the last few years at least, completed the Mackenzie Interchange. So the Mackenzie Interchange on Highway 1 and Mackenzie. 
This was years of backlog and during construction, even more years of backlog before construction. But in determining whether or not this project is worthwhile, we need to identify the referent group. Now, yes, we're going to have money coming in to fund this project at the local level, at the provincial level, at the federal level, all coming in to fund this. So where do we kind of look at the benefits? We have tourists coming through Victoria from all over the world. Now, if they're coming in through Victoria, if they're traveling up island, if they're going through, having this McKenzie interchange is a benefit to everybody. Doesn't matter if you live here or if you're a tourist coming through, you get the benefit of traveling through this now completed interchange. However, the costs of creating this interchange, they fall primarily on the provincial level, right? Provincial uh, BC Ministry of Highways and a degree on the federal level due to federal grants that come into it. Where do we draw the line? Where do we draw the line as to whose costs and whose benefits we're actually interested in, who we're actually concerned with in deciding whether or not this project is worthwhile? Again, this decision, this decision ultimately is a political one. Do we include it for all Canadians? Do we include it just for British Columbians? Or do we include it just for residents of the South Island? Political in nature for the policymaker to decide. Okay, that's about all I have to say about the referent group. In our case, we essentially just get this dictated to us as the analysis, and we just go and carry on from there. Next one is selecting the portfolio of options. Again, you'll see that I have here that, hey, step two is, again, a political decision, ultimately. That is, it's, again, decided by the policymaker. It's like, wow, this CBA is really easy. Just politicians dictate everything to us. Uh, good, good part of it is, right? Almost, almost half of it is actually just going to be dictated by, uh, by the political process, by the policymakers. In this case here, right, technically, we could have, we could have an infinite number of projects. So going back, what we're looking at is, hey, our decision to build a new highway. Well, we could make a new highway. We could evaluate the costs and benefits of making it one lane each direction. We could evaluate two lanes each direction, three lanes each direction, four lanes, on and on and on and on, right? There's technically an infinite number of projects that we could consider, that we could compare, and then identify the one that gives us the highest net benefit altogether to society. In reality, this isn't actually what's happening. In reality, the policymaker, the big wigs, the ones who are going to make this decision are going to say, hey, we want to put in a new highway. We are uh, figuring out, do we want to do a four lane or just a two lane versus nothing at all, right? So in this case here, yes, although we have this continuum of options, we're just going to be evaluating two, for example, right? Same thing could be said for school versus hospital. We could be looking at a small school, a middle-sized school, a large school, a very large school. We could be taking a look at a small regional hospital, an urgent care center, a larger hospital, a hospital that incorporates more kind of holistic approach, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Infinite number of possible options that are before us. It is the policymaker that will dictate, yes, but these are the ones that we're actually interested in. These are the ones that we are looking at potentially putting into place. So again, a political decision. Step three, catalog potential impacts and select our measurement indicators. Okay, what's going on here? Really what we wanna do is we wanna determine all the inputs and outputs from the project. So we wanna go through and just as such go, okay, what are all the inputs? What are all the outputs? In this step here, you're not interested in determining the value. You're not interested in determining, okay, what is this worth or what is it going to be valued at? What's the price of it? You're just listing everything that might impact this project. Typically speaking, and again, typically but not always, inputs are the costs. This is what goes in to make the project happen. And outputs, outputs are the benefits. Again, I say typically this is the case. This is not always the case. There are some notable exceptions. One of the notable exceptions would be environmental impacts. Well, environmental impacts, they are a result of 
the project. So they're an output of the project. So any environmental environmental degradation, that would be an output. And so that would enter in as a negative benefit, right? A negative benefit being, of course, a cost. One of the other big things that you'd often want to include in this as one of our inputs into the project would be your cost of funds, right? And this here is really recognizing that utilizing the money for this project is, well, you're gonna have two options really in the public sector. It's either gonna come from taxation revenue, which is then taking funds away from another source. So there's an opportunity cost with that, or, these funds are going to need to be debt financed. If they're going to be debt financed, they're going to have the interest associated with them. And that is then, of course, going to have its cost. So you'd really want to incorporate this cost of funds because, well, that's going to be a, potentially a pretty massive, a pretty massive element of this project. I really want to highlight this because our traditional decision making, I shouldn't say traditional, our common decision making process is to do it kind of through budgeting to say, hey, we have a million dollars for this department, for this ministry, and then within the department of ministry, you then allocate that based off of this cost-benefit analysis. Yes, cost of funds comes into play here, but what you gotta keep in mind is that even if we, if we properly allocate this money, if we properly figure out the cost of borrowing these funds, even if this is extra budget, even if this goes beyond what our budget was, if we have a large enough net benefit to society and we've incorporated the true cost of borrowing, it's still a worthwhile project, even if it exceeds the budget. And so getting ahead of myself here by a few chapters, but it just kind of addresses some of the limitations of the budgetary mindset of saying, nope, this is how much money you have. This is all you get to play with. It really limits the ability to finance or to fund certain projects that may actually improve social well-being altogether, if properly, if adequately analyzed at least. Big part, other, uh, big other part to keep in mind rather with cataloging potential impacts is to keep in mind of potential transfers. Potential transfers. So as we go through our all of our inputs, all of our outputs, some of these costs, some of these benefits might not actually be costs and benefits, but they might just be transfers within the referent group. And that is, so to say, if we were to build a new highway and in group A, we have a bunch of businesses that end up losing money, right? They end up losing money. They end up getting sad because the new highway creates construction, well, not even the new highway creates construction, the new highway reroutes away from the existing businesses. This is now your fast food, your grocery stores, your hotels, your gas stations that are no longer getting traffic. So they're being worse off because of it. However, there's another group, B, and all of these businesses all of these businesses are now seeing increased traffic and increased profitability because of where the highway is now running. Now, okay, it would be very easy to kind of look at this and say, oh yes, this here, this is a cost. Okay, this here, this is, this is a benefit, but they really aren't. All this is, is really a transfer from one part of our referent group to the other, from group A to group B. So we need to be careful about these potential transfers and say, okay, is it actually a net change in society that is an actual cost or an actual benefit, society being our referent group, or is this just a redistribution within the referent group? If it's just a redistribution within the referent group, it is just a transfer and something we would want to note. We would want to note it, but it wouldn't be part of our cost benefit. Okay, carrying on. Step four. Probably one of the first ones we'll watch you spend a bit of time talking about is defining our base case. Seems really easy. Unfortunately, it's often poorly done, primarily due to its difficulty in reality. Um, that is, right, defining the base case is extremely difficult to do because if we actually put the project into place, we'll never know what the base case was. If the project goes ahead, 
we don't get to watch two alternative versions of reality and say, okay, this is what reality worked out with the project in place. This is what reality worked out without the project. So that is this base case needs to be determined based off of forecasts. And we need to forecast the future to say, okay, what would happen under our business as usual kind of scenario? If we did nothing, if we had no intervention, where would we end up? A common fallacy with this is to assume that everything is just static. That, hey, what it is today is what it always will be. In reality, the base case is often dynamic, the base case is often changing, and the base case is often filled with a lot of uncertainty. So this whole bit of forecasting our future, well, this is filled with assumptions as to what we think might happen, and it is also filled with lots of uncertainty as well. So, okay, the step four here, lots of uncertainty. That is, right, as we're going through all of our steps, when we go through our sensitivity analysis, our base case is going to be one we want to come back and take a look at due to this uncertainty. Let's talk about this fallacy that we talked about, which is assuming a constant. So let's suppose that, again, here in BC, let's suppose that we wanted to implement a new policy, right, kind of already talked about, in order to get more electric vehicles on the road. And so what the government's looking to do is to provide a subsidy, kind of a benefit to you, if you scrap your traditional ICE vehicle, that is your internal combustion engine. That is, if you scrap it, if you get it off the road and you go and get an electric vehicle, they'll subsidize the purchase of your electric vehicle. Now, okay, what we need to figure out is before we put this policy into place is, well, what is what would happen underneath our policy scenario versus what would happen if we just did nothing? Common way of looking at this is going, okay, here we have our, we'll take a look at a little graph here. We'll take a look at our number of ICE, number of internal combustion engines over time. And then what we'll have is we'll have our policy date, that is when our policy takes effect. And we'll presume that up until this point, so a little short brief period of history, ICE adoption was something like that. So a number of ICE vehicles was relatively static, a little bit of a slight increase. We'll presume that following the policy, it just kind of continues and is just static as such. Versus, let's say, right, this would be our base case scenario if we did nothing at all. Versus if we put in the policy that is gave people money to trade in to scrap their ICE vehicles, we would say that the number of ICE vehicles on the road underneath this policy scenario would look something more like that. Now we see, hey, if the benefit is getting these ICE vehicles off the road, we see potentially a very large benefit, especially as time goes on, as it's like, hey, we're getting a lot of vehicles off the road by having this policy in place. Looks awesome if that's your goal. Well, what if we change our assumptions a little bit? What if we change our assumptions a little bit? What if we go and we say, here is the number of ICE vehicles, here is time. And again, we have our policy date. So when our policy takes effect, and again, we have our initial situation such that number of ICE vehicles is going up. Just slightly, right? Almost stagnant, but going up. Then we put in our policy. Well, we wanna take a look at our base case after the policy situation. And initially we just presumed it's kind of stagnant. But what if is what's happening is through other policies that are in effect, such as our carbon tax, such as improvement in technology for electric vehicles, such as et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What if in reality, the number of ICE vehicles on the road will just on their own naturally decrease due to these other pressures, due to rising operation costs, due to decreasing EV costs, et cetera, et cetera. Well, in this case, our base case is actually falling as we move through time, irrespective of the policy. This would be if we did nothing at all. However, if we put the policy in place, we witness that it can maybe fall a little bit faster. In this scenario, we see that, hey, our benefit, that is the difference between our base case number of ICE and the number underneath our policy is significantly smaller. So that is by 
choosing one base case over another, we have a very drastic impact on what we think our benefit would be of putting this policy into effect. Assuming constant costs on both sides, we might approve the project in our first scenario because massive benefits, constant costs, this might go ahead, be approved. In this scenario, these benefits might be small enough that the costs actually outweigh them, that it might be better just to do a laissez-faire approach, hands-off approach, just let the market due to higher gas prices, increasing technology, et cetera, et cetera, decrease IC vehicles on their own. So again, choice of base case is exceptionally, extremely important. Um, Big thing with this, big thing with all cost benefit analysis, actually, which is really where they're so amazing, is that they really require an interdisciplinary approach. Often the analyst who's doing this doesn't have the working knowledge of all of the different aspects that they are doing the analysis for. As a result, you really would need to work with different professionals from many different fields in order to really have an appreciation as to what is happening in those fields especially in order to be able to model these base cases, in order to model and forecast what you think might, would ha might happen in our business for usual case into the future. Okay, step five, monetize all impacts. This is, this is our controversial step. This is also filled with a bit of uncertainty and a few assumptions that need to be made. Now, as we kind of alluded to earlier, we need to monetize all of our impacts, all of our inputs, all of our outputs, all of our costs, all of our benefits. They need to be monetized. That is, they all need to be turned into some dollar value so that we can actually compare apples to apples. We can actually add everything up and we can say this is the value of all of our costs. This is the value of all of our benefits. And we can then make a decision accordingly. Of course, this is not easy. Of course, this is not without its controversy. Many, many of our impacts, as we took a look at already, are non-market, right? So having a non-market impact, this is a good or a service or a situation that is not traded on the free market. Because it's not traded on the free market, there's no readily available price that exists if there's no readily available price that exists, how do you determine its value? Uh, there's many ways that we as economists go through this and trying to figure out the imputed value and trying to figure out what society or what individuals would be willing to pay or be willing to accept for this good or service. But their estimates, their assumptions, they, depending on the one we're talking about, some might be more accurate than others, but they do have a degree of uncertainty around them. For example, what we talked about would be value of a human life, right? How do we do this? Well, not to get into all the different valuation methods, is there's many different ways that we determine this, but for example, the value of a statistical life here in Canada is about $5.2 million. And that is in constant 1996 dollars. So adjusting for inflation. As inflation goes up, right, as we fast forward through to today and prices have gone up clearly since 1996, so has that value of statistical life. So in 1996, $5.2 million. Similarly, we went and talked about, hey, polar bears. We said that polar bears were $420,000 a polar bear was the value we as Canadians place on them. This is difficult, this is a hard thing to kind of come across, but it is a required thing in order to be able to effectively allocate resources towards the right projects. Same thing needs to be said towards any project that has environmental effects. Yes, the project will have environmental impacts. We need to figure out, okay, if this project is gonna be creating X many tons of CO2, what is the cost of a ton of CO2? Well, we need to determine that. Sure, we have our carbon tax at $50 per ton of carbon dioxide, but is that actually reflective of the true social cost of a ton of carbon, or is that just what politically we have decided to price it at? Some estimates actually put the price of a ton of carbon closer to $300 a ton. So, right, we need to actually figure out what is the actual cost 
And how do we price that? How do we work that in? Um, as you're doing a cost benefit analysis in many ministries and many departments, there's usually guidelines in place about all, not all, but at least a majority of these non-market goods about how to price them, how to value them, which values to use for which goods. As you get outside of the standard non-market goods, of course, you start running into a bit more difficulty. And with that, it's a lot more primary research and figuring out, okay, what is this impact? What is the value of it? In our purposes, as I go through and have you conduct your own cost benefit analysis, any research you can do in determining what this implicit non-market value is, amazing, although probably beyond what is going to be happening. Uh, for the most part, what we're looking for as you go through your cost benefit analysis is just going to be a valid justified assumption saying, hey, I'm going to assign this a value of X dollars because X, Y, Z, right? And giving it a reason as to why you make that assumption. Any research you want to do into why you gave it that or why you think it's that is just bonus, is awesome, helps give you a stronger case for your assumption. But for our purposes, as we go through this, all of our non-market things will be more or less assumptions being made. There's also outside of our non-market goods we talked about as well, we'll have other impacts that are distortionary. So we'll also want to include this, and this is again underneath our underneath our implicit costs and benefits, is our distortionary costs and benefits. And these might be goods that are actually marketable goods, such as labor, such as concrete, uh, wood, lumber, all of this stuff is in a market, it has a price, but you could imagine if we were to all of a sudden engage in a massive project and we started to demand tons and tons and tons of concrete in order to produce this, this would push up the price of concrete, push up the price of cement. Now, all of a sudden, you're looking to pour a little patio slab in your backyard. What would have cost you $500 is now costing you $1,500. At $500, yeah, you would have just poured your own backyard patio slab. You would have been happy. You would have got the benefit from it. At $1,500, because this project is happening, they have essentially crowded you out. You have said at $1,500, sorry, this is not this project is not worth it to me personally. My patio is not worth it at this point. I'm no longer going to be doing it. So in this case here, by engaging in this bigger government project, increasing the price of cement, we have crowded out the private consumption of it. This is a social cost. This is an impact of our project that we would want to work out. And we're not going to get into the details as to how to work it out. Uh, it gets into supply and demand diagrams and areas underneath it. Super interesting and fascinating. Feel free to look into it on your own time if you're intrigued by it, but beyond our, beyond our scope for sure. So well, let's carry on. Let's take a look at step six, probably where we'll spend most of our time, which is calculating the net present value. So at this point, we have figured out all of our costs. We have figured out all of our benefits. We have monetized all of these costs. We have monetized all of these benefits. What we now have to do is realize that many of these costs, many of these benefits are going to accrue in the distant future. Based on the fact that many of these are going to accrue into the distant future, we need to figure out, okay, this future cost, this future benefit, what is it worth to us today? And this is important, right? If we value the future too much, we're going to put too much weight on these future costs. If we don't value the future enough, we're going to put too much weight on today. For example, if you take a look at infrastructure projects, uh, infrastructure. So we could be taking a look at the McKenzie Interchange we talked about earlier. We could be taking a look at the Site C Dam. We could be taking a look at any of these massive infrastructure projects. Typically, with these, all of the costs are born today or at least in a relatively short period of present time. So maybe this year and next year. However, there's no benefits being had this year, next year. All of our benefits, all of our benefits maybe accrue in year three forever into the future. Okay, this is problematic. 
if we put a lot of value on today, we go, okay, hey, look, today, next year, we're going to face all of these costs, but today, next year, we get no benefits. Well, okay, I don't care about future generations. I care about me. Costs are huge. Benefits are small. Reject. Uh, we'd never build anything, right? We'd never build any infrastructure projects if we took that view. Alternatively, if we valued the future too much, if we put way too much weight on the future, well, this is accruing off into nearly infinity. Based off of that, we would say, hey, as long as this project lasts for sufficiently long enough, the benefits will always outweigh today's costs. We'd be putting too much weight on future generations. All we would do is forego present period consumption. All we would do is forego our current benefits and consumption in trade for future generations. We would say, hey, yeah, I don't need to have anything today. I'm going to put everything into investment for the future generations. Again, you can imagine that's similarly problematic. There's a balancing between the two. So how do we figure this out? How do we find out a way, a balancing point between our value for today and our value for the future? That is, we need to find this balancing point. We need to find a balancing rate at which we discount the future. Let's take a look at the basic idea of that. Basic idea of that is, well, it comes down to ultimately the idea that if I were to offer you $100 and said, hey, you have the option that you can either take this $100 today or you can take this $100 next year. Which one would you choose? Well, predominantly, <laughs> predominantly by far and large, people say today, right? And there's really two reasons behind this is the first reason being, hey, you just you're going to value today more than you value tomorrow. Tomorrow is uncertain. You don't know what tomorrow holds. Today is certain. So, hey, I'd rather that hundred dollars today. or I don't know what tomorrow is going to look like. The other way that you can look at this is to say, hey, this one hundred dollars, if I take it today, even if I don't need it today, I could invest it, I could save it, and it's going to be worth more than $100 for me next year. So that is by taking it today, I'm better off by taking it today. Okay, in this way, even outside of that second case, right, where you take that money, you save it, you invest it, you get more next year, we saw that even if our inflation and our interest rates were zero, even if that you would still take the money today simply because you value today over tomorrow. Same idea if I said, hey, instead of paying you all of your money every biweekly period, I'll just pay you your entire wage at the end of the year. Technically, you're still getting the same amount of money, but you would say, no, I don't really like that because you'd have to wait for so long to get that money. And you're like, oh, I kind of need money today to eat. I value today, I value getting that money in a little incremental stream throughout the year rather than waiting. For it. So the idea is to what we'd want to determine is saying, okay, yes, right now you're going to say, I'm going to value today over next year. But what if I were to change this up? What if I were to say, I'll give you 100 today, or I'll give you 110 next year? Well, now you might be like, oh, okay, I value today, but you're giving me enough extra next year that maybe that you know extra little bit compensates my waiting. Maybe at this point, that kind of looks like a six. I said 110. Let's uh, make that into a zero. Maybe at this point, you're still like, you know what? Yeah, that, that little premium, that's nice. That's a bonus, but I still value today. I still like that a bit better. So you still take today. What if we change that then? What if we go and we say, well, what if I were to give you 100 and let's go 120, uh, let's actually make that a little bit cleaner, 125 next year. Okay, at this point, you're now going, ooh, a little bit extra. That, that's a nice premium for waiting. Okay, maybe now, maybe now I'm saying, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll take the money next year. I will wait and I will just get that money from you later. 
And okay, so now we've had a point where you're saying I value 125 next year more than I value $100 today. Awesome, we've now found a point where you flip back and forth. So what we wanna to do to kind of finish this off is we wanna find a point where you're indifferent. That is, we wanna find a point such that you're like, okay, $100 today or some amount of money next year, I'm kind of like, yeah, I could take either one. I really have a hard time deciding. I might as well just flip a coin and just kind of pick a value. Let's suppose that we'll say 115. So let's say we'll say if you had $100 today or 115 next year, you're really having a hard time deciding. You're like, I don't know. I'm just going to flip a coin if it's heads today, if it's tails next year. I'm completely indifferent between these two options. The reason why you would be indifferent between these two options is because the present value of this future money, the present value of that future money must be $100. That is that future money, that idea of future income is worth 100 to you today. And that is why you're indifferent. In that case where we said 125 next year, well, that must be that the case where that 125 next year, what you value that at today is going to be more than 100. That's why you jump at the 125 over the 100 because you're like, that is a better deal. I will go for it. At this case, though, we are indifferent. That is what we can say is really taking a look at this formula. We'll say value today times one plus some growth rate to the power of n, that's how many years we're going to compound for, equals value at the end. If we are indifferent between 100 and 115, then what we have is that the value today is 100. We have some growth rate, n, our number of periods, that's one. We are just looking at over one year. This today versus next year equals 115, right? So what we have here is we've just equated today's value with tomorrow's value. Our only unknown in this case is this growth rate. That is our discount rate that we're going to apply onto the future. Once we have this point of indifference, we can then go through and we can solve for this discount rate, this rate that makes me indifferent between today and tomorrow. Going through this, just some algebra to go through rearranging, and I'll just go through and just kind of show it generically. Our growth rate would be equal to the value at the end all over the value at the start to the power of one over n, so one over our number of years compounded, minus one. So okay, numerically, what does that give us? That gives us our discount rate, this growth rate is going to be 115 all over 100. Uh, what's our number of periods? We said one period, so that's just one over one minus one. So what do we get? 115 over 100 minus one, we get a discount rate of 15%. That is the rate at which you discount future income. That is the rate in which you're indifferent between today's money and tomorrow's money. To go back, we can then work out, we can then go and say, right, keep in mind that example where I said, hey, what if I were to give you 125? And we said, hey, at 125, you're like, you know what? Forget about today, I'll take 125 next year. Let's see why that's the case. Let's see why that's the case. And let's show how we can figure out the present value of next year's next year's money. And again, all it's really going to come down to is rearranging, rearranging this formula here. So let's jump over to a new page and take a look at that. So we said that we have 125 next year, and we've said that our growth rate or our discount rate is going to be 15%, 0 0.15.
we want to figure out what is our present value. What is this $125 next year? What is that value to me today? Okay, how do we figure this out? Well, our formula, if you recall, was V naught, one plus our growth rate to the power of N equals V one. In this case, we know our growth rate. We know the value in the future. We know how many years we're compounding over. That's just one, right? Our V1, that's 125. Our growth rate, that's 15%. What we don't know, what we don't know is what this is worth to us today. So what we can do is we can just do a quick rearranging here. We can say that the value today equals the value in the future all over one plus our growth rate to the power of n. That is just to write this another way, we can say that our present value equals that future value of money all over one plus our discount rate to the power of whatever year in the future that is. So in our case here, we have present value equals $125 being earned next year. This $120 be sorry, not 120, $125 being earned next year divided by one plus 0 0.15. And it's being earned next year. So that's to the power of one. So what do we get? 125 divided by 1.15. That gives us a present value of $108 and we'll say 70 cents, rounding to do decimal places. So that is to say, hopefully it's clear as to why we chose this 125 over the 100 today, because we're saying that, hey, this 125 next year is worth the same thing as if I said 108.70 today. And 10870 today, well, that's clearly more than 100 today, so I take the future money. This is the idea, at least with discounting. In this way, we can go and we can figure out what is today's value of any future value of money. And right, in this way, we can always go and we can say, okay, $125 in five years' time. What is $125 in five years' time worth to me? What is the value of that money? today. And so given our growth rate, given our discount rate, we could again go, okay, present value of $125 in five years time. So one plus 0 0.15, five years time. So that'd be the power of five, my value of N there being the number of years. So if I did, uh, let's uh, simplify this. Let's uh, not try to do too many steps in our calculator at the same time. So that's 125 all over 1.15 to the power of 5. So that's going to be 125 all over 2. Point, uh, we'll go 0114. Carry around a few extra decimal places there, right? Work through that guy then. 125 divided by 2.0114. I get the value of that today to be 62, uh, again, two decimal places, we'll go 62.15. So based off of that, we've successfully worked out that $125 received in five years time would be equivalent to $62.15 received today. Okay. All of that, a little bit of math, a little bit of technicality, not too bad though. Let's go through and let's see kind of, there's still a bit of controversy around this, right? So as we go through, you'll have to calculate present values of future flows of money um, as you conduct your own cost benefit analysis, right? As we go through this, your cost benefit analysis will likely have costs, will likely have benefits accruing into the future. Simple formula. What is that, right? In your step five, monetize your impacts. What is the value of the impact? What is the discount rate you've chosen, right? We went through the theory as to how you could ideally figure that out. Don't worry about that. What's the discount rate you assume? Give a reason as to why you assume that. 
And then in what year is that impact felt? By going through that, you get your present value. Turns out it's this choice of G that is where our controversy, our uncertainty comes from in this case. The controversy side is that, well, if we put G too high, we discount the future too much. By discounting the future too much, we put too much emphasis on our current benefits and costs. If we put G too low, we don't discount the future enough. That is, we're not giving enough value on today, we're giving too much value on tomorrow. And let's go jump and let's take a look at an example that kind of brings all of this together. So here we have our case. This would be kind of an outcome of step five. In step five, we would have all of our impacts. And we have right here, let's just get a little laser pointer so we can uh, really highlight things. In year one, we have our costs. So this would be like our infrastructure project where all of the costs are up front. So boom, right here today, we have $1,000 worth of costs. We also complete the project relatively quickly. So we're able to receive our benefit of 125 in year one as well. The benefit of 125, this then continues forever into the future, or at least over the lifespan of this project, which we will presume is 10 years. Okay, so this would be our step five where we've actually monetized everything and we figure out, okay, what is the entire monetary cost of our costs? What is the mo entire monetary value of our benefits? 125 for the benefits, 1,000 for the costs. Okay, from here, we'd wanna figure out the net present value. In order to figure out the net present value, we'd have to figure out the present value of our costs and the present value of our benefits. Keep in mind, this is year one, this isn't today, this would be next year. And so what we see is that all together our costs, right? So these costs, right, we're planning today, these costs are accruing next year in the future. So our costs are valued at 9.09 and nine cents. This is based off of a discount rate of 10%. We similarly see, see that the present value of all of our benefits is 113.64 in year one, 103.31 in year two, 93.91 in year three, on and on and on and on. Again, how do these how do these values come into play? Where do we get these values from? Well, this guy here, that would be 125, right? 125 all over our discount rate. So 1.10, that's from right there to the power of whatever period I'm looking at. So to the power of one. This guy here, 125 all over 1.10 to the power of two, because it's the second period. This final one here, that is 125 all over 1.10. Again, 1.10, that's my discount rate. And this is our 10th period. So I can figure out, hey, what is $125 worth for me in 10 years time, nine years, eight years, seven, on and on and on. I add years one through 10 all together and I get the current value of all my benefits, the present value of all my benefits. What we see here though, is that given this net present value, or sorry, given this discount rate of 10%, my costs exceed my benefits. That is, I've discounted the future so greatly that even though these benefits accrue for a long time into the future, I've discounted these future benefits so much that my costs are exceeding my benefits. And that is, I would give this project the red light. I'd say, nope, it's not going ahead. We will not look at this project. Okay, but could this be different just with a different discount rate? Well, let's take a look. Here we have same situation. So 125 of benefits all for 10 years, thousand worth of cost just being accrued in year one. And this time, however, what we're taking a look at is a discount rate of 2.5%. With a discount rate of 2.5%, we are not discounting the future nearly as much. And you can see that by taking a look at these future benefits. Right? They don't fall off nearly as quickly. That is in year 10, 
the present value of that $125 is still $97.65. It's still worth quite a bit to us. So in the same kind of way, what we can do is we can sum all of our costs over the lifetime of the project, again, the present value of all of our costs over the lifetime of the project, and we get total costs of 975.61. We similarly sum all of the present values of all of our benefits over the lifetime of the project, and we get a present value of all of our benefits of 1,094 and one cent. In this case now, our benefits exceed our costs and that is, we would say, yes, benefits exceed costs. We would give this project the green light. It has the go ahead. So, okay, hopefully you see rather the arbitrariness of that is that based off of our choice of a discount rate, we can almost force a project into rejection or exception territory. This is really why the choice of the discount rate is so important, why that choice of a discount rate really needs to be determined beforehand and have a good reason, a good rationale as to why the discount rate that was chosen was chosen. Depending on whether these cost benefit analysis are being done for the private sector or the public sector, often different discount rates will be utilized. For example, if it's being done in the private sector, typically you will use the internal rate of return versus in the public sector, you would often use the public sector discount rate. If you're interested, again, beyond the scope of this course, beyond what we're interested in getting into, you can take a look at either of those terms and kind of get an idea as to what's going on there. Again, for our project, I would recommend you kind of use a discount rate of about 2 to 3%, somewhere around that range there. If you wanted to use something different, again, just give the rationale as to why and make the case for your assumption. It might be very simply, hey, I don't value the future. I really care about today. Today is what's important to me. So yeah, tomorrow, I don't care about tomorrow if I'm worried about eating today. So because I don't care about tomorrow, I'm gonna to have a very high discount rate. Alternatively, it might say, you know what? I'm very optimistic. I really live in the future. The future is where I think it's gonna be. I get a lot of value about just thinking about the benefits in the future. I'm going to have a really low discount rate and you can justify it accordingly. Keep in mind is that the choice of your discount rate could very well result in a different in difference in outcome. And again, this here is going to be part of our uncertainty, part of our sensitivity testing as we carry through. Okay, carrying on step seven, identifying distributional impacts. Again, this is going to be a political decision, um, at least what's going to be uh, dictated to you will be partly political. The analysis will still be done on your side, on the analysis side. That is, while our net present value or our present value calculations, they were done on the aggregate. That is, we just took all of those impacts from step five, all of the impacts, all of the costs, all of the benefits, we just added all the costs together, figured out the present value of the costs. We added all of the benefits together, figured out the present value of the benefits, and then benefits minus costs gave us our net present value. Okay, in this case, what we're interested in is how are those costs accrued? How are those benefits accrued to different impact groups? So that is within our referent group, we would break our referent group up into different impact groups and we would try to, diff uh, try to discern the best that we could which costs are faced by which impact groups, which benefits are received by which impact groups. This gives us kind of this distributional idea as to what happens due to the policy, due to the project, due to whatever we're performing this analysis on. The choice of impact groups, the choice of impact groups, that is the political decision. Who's in this impact group? Who's in that impact group? Political decision. Not a decision to be made by the policy analyst. So that's the point to be made there. Once you have that, really this kind of goes into your actual determining, right? Do Is this project going to go ahead or not go ahead? For example, it might have a massive amount of net benefit to society but all of the costs are accrued to one group. 
this could potentially be politically unpopular, this could potentially be problematic, and it could kill a project, despite the social benefits. You might be thinking, hey, but huge amounts of net social benefit altogether, isn't that a potential Pareto improvement? Isn't that a situation where society wins so much that we could potentially compensate the losers? Yes, yes, we could. But keep in mind in our definition of a potential Pareto improvement, you don't actually have to compensate the losers in order for it to be a potential Pareto improvement. And what that means is, unfortunately, often those losers are not compensated, and often it does thus create the political problems. If we could compensate the losers effectively, then yes, that could be a way around this problem. But that would then also be part of your redistribution, your costs and benefits of the project would be going back and working out that aspect. So some, some potential issues with that. Uh, not much else to say about that. That's uh, really just rejigging your monetizing impacts, your present values based off of impact group rather than being on aggregate. Step eight. Step eight is going to be performing your sensitivity testing. Uh, so as we said, going through this, many parts of the analysis were based on assumptions and uncertainty. So we need to test how sensitive our net present value is, that is how sensitive our result is to these assumptions. Some big areas that you would want to kind of fluctuate, that you would want to play around with, would be the baseline. Your business as usual case. What if that was different? What if your forecast was wrong? How sensitive is your result to this baseline? Outside of that, you would also want to take a look at your non-market impacts. So your non-market valuations. If you made assumptions based off these non-market valuations, what would happen if those assumptions changed? Uh, for some of these non-market valuations, if you're performing an actual cost-benefit analysis, like I said, some of these will just be dictated to you. Value of a human life in a federal CBA is going to be used as this value. Uh, that kind of situation. So those, ah, those don't really get to fluctuate, but certain non-market valuations may. And what you'd want to do is you'd want to change those. You'd want to fluctuate them between their extremes to see how sensitive your result is, your net present value is to this aspect. Finally, finally, you would want to kind of fluctuate your discount rate. So you made your justification, you made your choice as to why you're using the discount rate you did, but how sensitive is your result to this discount rate? If the discount rate were to change by plus or minus one percentage point, that is 100 basis points, would your result significantly change? What if it were to change by five percentage points or 500 basis points? Would that significantly change your result? At that point, it very well might. Um, but the whole point of this is to figure out how sensitive is your result to these levels of uncertainty. Now, the more kind of common your result is, that is the more it's like, hey, you know what? No matter my choice of baseline, I get the same result. No matter my choice of non-market valuations, I get pretty much the same result. No matter my choice of discount rate, I get pretty much the same result the more robust your analysis is, right? The more certain you can be that, hey, the social benefits exceed the social costs. The more kind of like, uh, as the sensitivity analysis is done, more often I'm kind of falling into reverse territory, such that costs are exceeding benefits. Uh, your analysis is not necessarily as robust and you'd be a little bit more cautious in your recommendation in this case, saying, yes, based off of initial assumptions, based off the initial case, we have benefits exceeding costs. Yes, we uh, suggest this project go ahead. However, keep in mind, it is subject to these assumptions. And if we have these drastic changes in the world around us or a failure of our assumptions, this might not actually hold up any longer. So again, something to include in your write-up and your recommendation, which brings us to step nine, which is actually making the recommendation. Very simply, Right on the very simple side, if benefits exceed costs, yes, go ahead. If several projects all have benefits exceeding costs, then you would list them in descending order. So starting with the one that's the most, biggest, highest amount of net benefit to society, and then going down and down and down to the smallest one. Ultimately, again, this is a political choice. 
as the analysis, you make your recommendation. You've done all the work. It is the policymaker, the decision maker who will choose the project that best fits for their own political agenda, right? And that might not always be what was the best project for social welfare and a big thing to keep in mind there. Okay, so through this, what we've taken a look at is a very quick and dirty overview of a cost benefit analysis. In reality, we could probably spend a week or more on each of these steps, exploring the practices and the common difficulties in each of them. Unfortunately, right, that's really not the scope of this course. Really, what we're doing in this part here is just kind of say, hey, going back to the previous chapter, we made the case that we have room for government intervention. Here we're saying, hey, the government could intervene. Could intervene. What is a tool, what is a way that the government could look to say, should we intervene in this case? Should we launch this project or should we not? The cost benefit analysis allows for us to kind of take a look at efficient allocation of resources. That is to try to find a place to pick this project that results in the highest increase to social welfare. By having the highest increase to social welfare, we are kind of moving towards that most efficient allocation of resources and a best case scenario kind of uh, incorporating kind of our theory of second best in that. What we have left to cover, want to discuss just a few common errors that we run into in conducting cost benefit analysis, or rather that are run into in conducting a cost benefit analysis. And then once we cover that, we'll wrap up and conclude this video. So some common errors, let's take a look. First common error is an incorrect baseline incorrect baseline. As we discussed already, this is a common fallacy, is just kind of doing our business as normal case as a static case. This is what it is today. This is what it always is. I have another story about this. I don't really know the credibility or the truthfulness of the story, but I found it a good one that kind of uh, shows, demonstrates this point to us. And what it goes back to is way back with the previous, way previous NDP government and the whole fast cat fairies and the issue with these fast cat fairies. And I mean, there was lots of issues with these fast cat fairies from procurement to everything with it. But one of the big kind of reasons for them is that they were significantly faster. Unfortunately, despite the fact that they were faster, they carried less vehicles. Less vehicles, so less passengers altogether. The argument was that although each trip carried less passengers, because of their extra speed, they were able to go so much faster that it compensated for this. Problem is, right, it's... Uh, You'll, you'll laugh here. I'm going to draw, attempt to draw the peninsula. So Sydney Peninsula, our entire South Island here. Here we go. And then out towards Langford, etc. And then going up towards the Malhat. Yeah, there we go. We'd have Salt Spring Island, something like that. We'd have our other Gulf Islands as we go through. And there we go. And then somewhere over here, we have the Swasson Ferry Terminal. Okay. So in this example, ferries leave, and right, we have some more islands down here. Ferries leave Swartz Bay. They work their way through all of these Gulf Islands. And if you've ever done this route, there's some very narrow passages in here. And then finally, we get to the open bit of the strait, and we can kind of make a beeline towards the ferry terminal. Let's uh, kind of make that a little bit more visual that this is a ferry bit different color than what we used for our islands and everything else there. There we go. Maybe that's a little bit better. Maybe that just made it worse. I don't know. Okay. So in this, our base case scenario was really just this assumption that, hey, we have to travel from A to B, and A to B is going to be X number of nautical miles. Okay. So if it's X number of nautical miles and we can travel at whatever Y speed, then we can complete this trip in Z hours, right? And then based off of that, they can work out, okay, how many trips we can do during a time. Well, okay, this is kind of where 
this is how the story goes, how much of it is urban legend, how much of it is just a comical kind of thing, who knows, but it does still kind of point to the fallacy that could exist here and the importance of having interdisciplinary reaction in conducting these is this is how I'm told it was done, is A, B, nautical miles, here's the top speed of the fast cat ferry, so there we go, there's the number of hours. Maybe that seems to make sense at first appearance. However, what you have to keep in mind is the ferry is not able to do this top fast cat speed over the entire time. Or if we're referring to the baseline, the initial replacement ferry, what is being replaced, they weren't able to do their speed over this entire stretch, full speed for the entire time. That is, it takes a period of time for the ferry to get up to speed as it leaves berth. And very similarly, it can't go into berth full speed either. It needs to slow down. So you have a period on either side of slower speed. Additionally, as the ferry is navigating these Gulf Islands, these narrow passes, all the traffic, etc., all the underwater hazards, the ferry, again, is very unlikely to be able to do anywhere near its top speed. So all of this section here would, again, be under top speed. And then once we hit the straight, assuming clear seas, assuming not a ton of extra traffic, the ferry could then begin to accelerate, meaning the ferry could only maybe do top speed for this bit here. Thus the problem with our baseline. The initial assumption, the initial assumption being, hey, here's the top speed of the ferry, can do top speed A to B. New fast cat ferries, here's their speed, they can do top speed A to B. Wow, look at the savings. In reality, this is a mistake both in baseline and policy, in reality, the initial ferries could only ever do top speed between, we'll say, X and Y. And very similarly, the fast cats could only ever do top speed between X and Y. The remaining green areas, well, during that green area, both ferries, old and new, would be doing roughly the same speed. So that is, right, just choice of baseline is extremely important and just see some of the fallacies that may, that may exist in conducting this. Okay, what else do we have for common errors? Another common error is going to be a chain reaction problem. So chain reaction problem. And this really gets at two aspects, one of which we have already talked about. So the chain reaction problem is really going through as counting secondary costs and benefits. So kind of going through and like hunting down and going, oh, okay, yes, we're building a new highway because we have to go build this new highway. Oh, poor Jane, who's a few blocks away. She now has to have more dust in the air. This more dust means that she now has to pressure wash her house more often in order to clean it, in order to make sure that it's maintained. This is a cost to Jane. This is a, right, a physical cost, an explicit cost in her having to hire someone to pressure wash her house, as well as an implicit cost in uh, loss of mental well-being, et cetera, et cetera, right? You can come up with these kind of secondary effects for any project. And depending on how crafty you are, you can come up with massive secondary costs and benefits for every project. This is very problematic, right? This is very problematic because if you wanted to, you could just kind of force a project in any one direction or another. The point of the cost benefit is to look at the primary impacts. The additional problem with this is that often these secondary impacts aren't actually costs or benefits, but are rather transfers, right? They are transfers within the referent group. So for example, we could go and take a look and we could say, hey, you know what? We're against this highway being produced or being produced, being uh, built. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look and we're going to say, hey, look, this new highway is going to cause loss of profit going to cause tons of businesses to shut down. All of these businesses that are shut down, this is a cost, this is a loss to society. Well, as we already saw, yes, a bunch of businesses might shut down in one area, but more businesses might do significantly better along the new rooted highway. As a result, this here is not really a secondary 
a secondary cost or a secondary benefit. It is simply a transfer from one group to another. So a big thing as we go through our cost benefit analysis is to focus on the primary impacts, not the secondary or tertiary impacts. It's very easy to follow kind of the rabbit down the rabbit hole. Don't do that. Focus on the primary impacts. Our next problem is double counting. Okay, what do we mean by double counting? Well, the best way to illustrate this is with an example, and this example is actually, was actually the prescribed way that cost benefit analysis were being done in the US for a while. I believe it was the Department of Agriculture that was doing it this way, although I might have that department wrong. Um, what it was is taking a look at this example is looking at the cost benefit to providing irrigation irrigation to arid land. Okay, so we had pretty much a desert, whole bunch of really arid farmland. And right, yes, these individual farmers could do the irrigation themselves, but the scale that was needed and the coordination between a whole bunch of individual farmers was too much to be done on the private level. So we're evaluating whether or not it's worth it for the government to step in and provide this irrigation on behalf of the region. Okay. So we go and we take a look at this and we start taking a look at the benefits and we start listing the benefits. So benefit, benefit one, increased crop yields, increased crop yields. Oh, that's, that's a bonus, especially for those farmers. Now their land's irrigated, they have these crop yields. These crop yields mean more income for the farmer. Great, benefit. Our second one is going to be increase. I'm just going to abbreviate that instead of writing increase. I'm just going to go up arrow. Uh, increase land value. Okay, so now all of a sudden we have an actual, what used to be a struggling farm is now a very prosperous farm. As it's now a really prosperous farm, hey, these farms land value has gone up. This is now equity in the farmer's pocket. This is looks like two benefits. Problem is it's not. Problem is it's one benefit that we are double counting. We could either count increased crop yields or more realistically, what we ought to count is the increased land value. And the rationale here is that the latter, the increased land value, it incorporates the former, the increased crop yields. The reason, the reason why we have this increased land value is because of the increased crop yields. Because the land is more productive, the land is now worth more than it used to be. So if we had double counted both the increased crop yields and the increased land value, we're just inflating our benefits. Same could be said for the costs. You could also double count costs as you go through things. So you really have to be really paying attention to the benefits and really thinking through, okay, is this benefit actually standalone? Or is this benefit actually incorporating other aspects as well? So issue of double counting. Final one to wrap us up really isn't an error, but kind of a caution is many cost benefit analysis use the benefit cost ratio as their decision making tool. So keep in mind what we introduced here was just strictly, if benefits greater than costs, then approve. And if the net benefit, whichever one had the largest net benefit, so that was benefit minus cost, whichever one had the largest net benefit was the best project out of the ones being shown. Another way you could look at this is with the benefit cost ratio. And the idea with the benefit cost ratio is to find the project that has the best value, the best bang for its buck. And in this case here, what you're looking at is the ratio between benefits and costs. In this case, if this ratio benefits over costs exceeds one, then yes, you would approve the project, right? If it's bigger than one, it's because the benefits are bigger than the costs. If this benefit cost ratio is less than one, well, then you would not approve the project because benefits are less than costs. 
Very similarly, just as we said, hey, the highest net benefit is the one you would approve, the one you would want to ideally adopt. The one with the largest benefit cost ratio you would adopt. Right, because the one with the largest benefit cost ratio, this is the one that provides the best value to the taxpayer, the best value to society. You get the most benefit for the least amount of cost. Seems like a great idea, and not to say that it's wrong, but there are some things to consider with it. And we can quite easily contrive an example where by choosing a project based off of the benefit cost ratio actually yields a suboptimal project from a social benefit standpoint. And let's, let's take a brief uh, look at an example of that. So two projects, we'll call them project A and project B. We'll take a look at our benefits for each. We'll take a look at our costs for each. We'll then go and we'll calculate the benefit cost ratio as well as the net benefit. Okay, so project A. We'll say project A has benefits of $10. Project B has benefits of $100. Project A is significantly cheaper to put into place. We're gonna say that it has costs of eight, while project B is significantly more expensive with costs of 90. Working through our benefit cost ratio, so 10 over eight, that gives us a ratio of 1.25 versus project B 100 over 90, that gives us 1.11. So taking a look at benefit cost ratios, both of them are greater than one. So both of them are in our exception zone saying, hey, these are good projects. But taking a look at which one do we suggest? We would suggest project A. It has the best value to the taxpayer, the best bang for its buck. However, let's take a look at the net benefit of each. The net benefit of each, so benefit minus cost, well, Project A only provides a $2 net benefit to society. Project B, benefits minus costs, provides a $10 net benefit to society. So what we see in this case here is that if we, vow, if we just base off of which one causes the greatest increase in social welfare, we see that project B provides the largest increase in social benefit, net benefit. So we get kind of a conflicting result between the two rules as to which project is ideal. And like I said, although the benefit cost ratio is not an error, although it's not problematic, it is something to use with caution. It's a way to yes, determine best value, but it can very easily overlook something that results in the highest amount of net benefit, that is net increase in social welfare. Okay, so that does us for our video. Uh, we've taken a look at the cost benefit analysis. We've taken a look at the nine steps of a cost benefit analysis and some of its common errors and problems that we run into in doing it, some of the controversies around it. Again, this serves as just a quick and dirty intro into the process. By no means does it do the process a complete justice. There is so much more into this, and personally, I find it a fascinating, a fascinating project altogether to conduct these, but again, far beyond our scope. The purpose of this was to create an understanding and appreciation of the process in determining at least one way that public firms, or public or private, so public governments, municipal, provincial, federal, um, or private firms can decide and adopt one project or decide between competing projects. Should you have any questions about this, should you have any questions at all regarding a cost-benefit analysis, please feel free to comment below, leave a post on D2L, or of course, please feel free to send me an email. Again, this cost benefit analysis is explicitly one of our assignments for the course, one of the things that I will have you complete. So if you do have any parts of this that you're stuck up on, that you're kind of hung up on, please feel free to reach out. A uh, big part with it is a lot of this, as you go through it, is just going to be assumption, is just going to be your kind of best guess at the scenario. Any extra research, any extra kind of bit you go in to look into it is great, recommended. It's going to really get you to that highest grade you can get. But 
you don't need to go too crazy on that. Again, feel free to reach out with any questions. Until next time.